So good evening and welcome to Dia's Readings in Contemporary Poetry series. My name is Megan Whitco and I'm an assistant curator here and it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody to tonight's reading. So as you may know or hopefully know, this is our very first reading of the fall season and we have an exciting lineup of poets who are going to be joining us for the remainder of 2015 and I will let Vincent uh, share those details with you all very shortly. Uh, Vincent Katz is the curator of Dia's Readings in Contemporary Poetry series and uh, tonight is the start of our sixth season so it's been five years that he's been bringing together uh, a really diverse group of poets and voices uh, here at Dia Chelsea and uh, inviting them to share their work with one another and uh, with us as a larger audience. So I'm very pleased to welcome our two poets for tonight's program. Uh, we have Todd Colby and Bobby Bird. So thank you both for... <laughs> so thank you to Todd and Bobby for uh, generously accepting our invitation to be a part of this series. The Readings in Contemporary Poetry is supported by the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and uh, also the Brooklyn Brewery, who we want to thank for the uh, complimentary cold beverages we're enjoying this evening. And I also want to uh, thank uh, Dia's staff uh, who helped coordinate this series, um, in particularly Kelly, Francesca, Mary Catherine, Maria, Max, Allison, Carly, and Julian, who are all helping us tonight. So following our first reader, uh, we have a brief about 10 minute intermission uh, before resuming with the second speaker. Uh, during that time, we will have uh, books uh, available by both poets uh, for sale out at the table where you checked in just uh, not too long ago. And other than that, I think it's now time to give a very warm welcome to Vincent Katz, who's going to introduce our first reader for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, and thank you all for coming out tonight. We're excited to kick this season off with a great reading. And I uh, just want to let you know about our upcoming readings. Um, so on October 13th, we're going to have Tracy Morris and Sheila Patterson, and that should be really funky and far out. Uh, Tracy's bringing her band, so it's going to be a full-on rock and roll funk poetry night. Um, November 10th, Changing Gears with Robert Hershon and Simon Pettit. And then on December 8th, we're going to have Amy King and Alan Davis. So hope you'll join us on those nights. Todd Colby has published six books of poetry. Rip Snort, Cush, Riot in the Charm Factory, New and Selected Writings, and Tremble and Shine were all published by Soft Skull Press. Flushing Meadows was published by Scary Topiary Press in 2013. And Colby's latest book, Splash State, was published by The Song Cave in 2014. He lives in Brooklyn. A Todd Colby poem arrives with a rumble. It bursts into your listening or reading space. It is not orderly, but rather rambunctious, occasionally bellicose, sometimes political, but mostly burrowing into the level of language and communication that seems to arrive spontaneously, gearing his image of a day to the altered senses he engenders in his listeners and readers. Todd is an energetic presence, an individualist who is also a team player. The dictionary says of the word rambunctious that it is of unknown origin. How rare and cool is that? Maybe we could say Todd Colby as a poet is of unknown origin, for though we can observe his familiarity with, for example, New York school poetry, and we feel rushes of Ashbery and O'Hara and even Schuyler in there, still Todd is too committed to being Todd to let the literal intrude on his desire. Most of all, his poems are love poems. I'm curious to find out to whom they are addressed but he by and large keeps that a secret, which has the effect of making his poems love poems to life. He likes mornings, and he is aware of the effects of time. I could have you, need you, break with you. I could spend hours with you. 
eating pieces of you and making the world change with you, he writes in Morning Poem. While in, in Wings, he writes, there are mornings and then there are golden glimpses of something totally amazing like awe or coffee. Todd Colby, for all the zany cunning his poems effect, is at heart a sane poet in an insane world. He's dedicated to that. Please join me in welcoming Todd Colby to Dia. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. Um, I, you know, it, I have to reflect for a moment. I just remember in 1988 um, seeing James Schuyler Reed when Dia was downtown and the, all the really great readers that have been part of this um, series, Alice Notley, John, so many people. So I feel very humbled and honored to be here. Thank you for coming, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to start off with a, a few new poems, and then I'm going to read from Splash State. <clears throat> the first one is called A Wee Smidge. That sound you hear in Brooklyn is everyone really showing up for work. Needless to say, we are all a bit tired, like we wish it was the next day, there. You invented a revolution that only works for you. Willy Wonka was built on the idea of an heir or a legacy. Can't you see I'm burning? Out in the open, a deer wound vibrates. With the right bandwidth, it could be the 19th century. Mayakovsky's dyslexia is well known. Everything is happening at once, literally. This morning, I woke up and made a list of my top 10 worries, and then I rooted around in the junk drawer. Brooks' ghost, Albert's ghost. All the water I use in a year could fill this apartment up to the ceiling twice. Anything that makes you laugh is true, and you know it's true. I am genuinely going to and fro in 3D. Uh, this is from a longer series of poems, but I'm just reading a couple of the numbered ones. It's called number 25. Mope King, you are numb to me. Your video is dropping out in the purple twilight. Ripples cascade over black water. The wreck is ornate and speckled with garish jewels. Autocorrect. The fissure is blossoming on all you loved. Blink and the next one is gone and all who follow in their wake. To bells, listen, those people are gone. Heady, dim things, all the Roman strobes around them illuminate their great secrets. The way other minds work is a mystery to me. Summer peaks like the inkling of a bow. The brain is golden, moist. And this is called Upholstered Furniture. I just sat down on my serpentine back mint damask sofa and propped my feet up on my imported needlepoint side chair. I might sit on the blue camelback sofa later this afternoon. I just tossed a book of poems on the high back tapestry sofa. Perhaps I'll spread out on the apartment sized linen sofa. Oh, the blue floral tufted back sofa, or the flare arm sofa, or the oversized slipcover tuxedo sofa. That thing is roofless. If you ever visit me, we shall sit on the oxblood tufted leather love seat. There, we will gaze upon my tempting, tempting tapestry sofa and my blueberry blue chair. We'll have drinks in my French country wing chairs. After so much laughter, we'll retire to the beige damask sofa. Perhaps I will send you home with my cotton print sofa with decorative trim. <laughs> and this is called Basil Bunting. Make a mess like a deer trapped in a tiny bathroom. Get groggy and blabber with sleepy joy. You are in a beautiful city made of soft stuff. Light up the room with your glowing endorsement. Lift the laptop above your head and make a scary sound. 
Tell us what it's like to fall through the ice on a frozen river. Startle us from your best hiding place. Assume big baby status among smaller babies. Tell us about the collapse of the sugar punks. Whistle and make the dog all jazzed. Send sparkles into the air when you fluff the pillows. Lick lemon jelly from the tip of your finger. Serve treats to us and light up and lighter. Brooklyn. The trees in Brooklyn are the same color as overcooked hamburger. I know the song of the cardinal, and it goes a little something like this. Pangs twist a belly until dawn. It says, eat. The light in early December hurts my eyes and yours. A chilled apple, a lit candle, and early blues. The smell of wormwood somewhere is making me think of Long Island City. What a person does on a Saturday is purposefully radiant and productive. If a stroll under the Manhattan Bridge brings you solace, go there. If a hat provides joy, they are sold all over the place. <laughs> Watch the film you paid to see. In my bedroom, my weight is three times more than what I'd weigh on Jupiter. <laughs> if your kitchen was on Mercury, I'd be heavier by half of you while sitting at your table. On Uranus, a quarter of my weight is meat or an awareness of myself as flesh. On Venus, the light would produce a real volume around me that would make me look happy in photographs. This is how it is with quantity in any life. It's a fact that on certain planets, I'd actually be able to mount the stairs four at a time. <laughs> Think of the most beautiful horse in the world. A ridiculously beautiful golden horse with a shimmering coat. It would weigh no more than an empty handbag on Mars. You need to get real about these things. <laughs> Monday, gingerly. Let us drizzle butter over a bowl of peat moss and call that a way to spend a Monday. You don't have time to clown around in the dark now that the sky has turned a militant, rusty blue. A list of things that make your lips numb would help us learn what to feed you in your free time. Rub your quad, rub your hammy, and take the red pill you found on the bathroom floor. You live in a safe world of true New Yorkers. And going back to the numbered series, this is number two. Dear people with the fever, please help me pitch these hydrochloric pelts. A yellow mitten tumbles down the street. The milk goes chlorine pepper. I'll always get a lot out. Big breaks form an alliance and leave pox. They are sugary and parental, but really fun and short of sharp. Look at the glare on that farm machine. You are on the beach with rippled glimpses of ships. Soothe us with stories about your face. The closest star to us is just not close at all. There is a racket in these structured days for all of us. This is tantamount to a lubricant. Half a car for half a block. The rubber and straw are from us. Disastrous consequences. If it's not too late, I would like to make big changes in nearly everyone by Wednesday. <laughs> I'm heading to the fire tower. Do you understand what I'm saying? Human beings are awkward, and they transmit a hard edge that makes it difficult to get things done around them. Slush, ice, rain, shit. A mother points at her son's boots and says, those are not completely rainproof boots. And the son takes note of it, and he remembers. Some people find relief when they listen to music that has a certain tone that appeals to their own tone. It's going to be all right because we are flesh at this juncture. 
your agency knows no release. Joy Division did a wonderful cover of Sister Ray that peters out at the end. Pigeon. Pigeon. I swear that pigeon is messing with me. He's strutting around the thin concrete park on Bergen Street next to Domino's like he was King Bird. On top of that, he's not making the sound of a bird, but more like the sound a child makes trying to sound like a bird. That pigeon is just off. He pokes around the sidewalk for a piece of bagel or donut while looking back at me every once in a while like I'm an asshole or something. <laughs> Our bodies are composed of more bacteria than flesh. That is one more symptom of my unease. Pick up a newspaper, bite into an apple, and wash your dishes by hand. Sooner or later, you'll come to the realization that the casing around your body is too permeable. The thoroughness of your unity with your surroundings is laughable. And now for a pitch-perfect rendition of I'm over you. And this is the last of the new poems, and this is called Three Pete. The throw over the bed is a beach towel from Tunisia. On the radio in the other room, someone is playing piano very energetically. The sky in Brooklyn looked like the sky in Paris for a bit today. Broken French is all I have for you. When a person or team wins at something three times in a row, it's called a three-peat. I used Windex to wipe away the milk rings on the aluminum table. How much incense is too much incense? a veritable boon of good weather over the past few weeks. Here, along the Atlantic, no one moves gracefully anymore. Dull leaflets and sulky blahs. The throw has tassels. And now I'll read from, uh, from Splash Day. And this is called Scram. Do you remember when the crowds would disperse along the river and wander into the hills, split by the muted nobility of earnestness and palimpests? Do you remember when the dirge of the day sounded regal and pointed, not harsh and blotted? Do you remember when the lucrative jangle of rented spaces and wet-throated desire was for the warm, honey lob spank of mulberry? Do you remember when the pastries were coarse and inedible, powdered, not with sugar, but the richest cream of tartar? Do you remember when the moist towelettes would stack neatly in the vestibule, halting not just the flow of blood, but also of all thought and intent? Do you remember when the soft breezes of March carried birds that would fly in soft circles, signifying something new and slightly scary? And this is called Love Poem, and it's for Tara tonight. My screen name is Fast Learner. I can use a computer and send links. I've used a remote control, a microwave, Microsoft Word, a microfiche, a microscope, retail pro, a chamois, and a Swiffer. I can identify fennel, rhododendrons, <laughs> wisteria, tulips, and overpronation. I know that a red drink known as a Shirley Temple is a real treat in certain circles. I know that a bag of almonds does not constitute dinner, though it has on more than one occasion. I know that when I think someone wants to kiss me, I'm usually right. I know that when I take too many vitamins, my stomach hurts. I've washed dishes and made eggs the French way. I've used Dawn, Clorox, Diptyque, Serge Lutin, and Le Lobo. I've walked along the water, bumped the crap out of my head, stubbed my toe on that fucking end table, and dusted under the bed. I like Werner Herzog and chocolate granola. I would like to get to know you better. And this is called Sit Still. 
What morning does is trick you into thinking someone's just left to go to the bathroom, or is drinking tea at the big table in the living room, or is simply thinking of you while they stand in front of a full-length mirror and twerk. You think someone is there, but they're gone. Morning makes you think you can solve problems, do maths and thoughts, and change your clothes. Morning is as light and creamy as an instrument of hypnotism or cuisine. Perhaps your heart was put in your chest simply to pump sludge around your body until it hits your brain and you stumble around like a dork. And this is called the clothing of my death. I'm not sure if the clothing I'll die in has been manufactured yet. Perhaps a bolt of cloth sits in a warehouse in New Jersey somewhere that will be made into the clothing of my death. Or perhaps none of the cloth exists yet. Perhaps I'll get a shutter that will serve as a warning of some sort on the day the clothing I'll die in is being harvested or chemically mixed to create synthetic cloth. It could be years from the time of manufacturing of the clothing until the day I buy it. How many years would I do city stuff in the clothing of my death, like walking to the subway, sitting on a bench, eating in a restaurant, riding in a taxi, shopping in a grocery store, or strolling in a park. Perhaps the clothing I'll die in has already been purchased. Perhaps a favorite shirt of mine will be on my body when I'm taken to a morgue. The shirt will be half cut away, or there will be no signs of anything harmful to the shirt done at all, but I will be too oddly pale to be napping, too blue around the lips and eyes to suddenly wake up and say, this is not the clothing of my death. I went through this period where every time I would buy a piece of clothing or a eight pack of toilet paper. I thought it was such a faith in the future in some way. Was, and, and then thinking like this could be the last, I, this could be the shirt that I die in. And, and the poem explained that, but. <clears throat> Fun. I don't want to scare you, but this is the sum of my autumn cheer. Zilch. When I go into my room, I feel dusty air in my blouse. They say a lack of oxygen is good for the spirit. That's crap. I would gladly let you poke my spirit if it smelled expensive like people shopping at Bergdorf Goodman. Regardless of shallow self-reflection, it helps to know what to wear for any occasion. You don't feel joy when you get dressed in the morning? Is it your hair or something? Is there anything I need to know? A real cute outfit is a good example of having a super fun time until someone tries to eat you. Beaming yellow stripes down the neck, leading to a red sash around the waist, looking good. Sit on the stoop with me and watch the traffic ooze over today's landscape. I love you, but in my head I want to be mesmerized and breathe through a straw embedded in cement. I've gone into the ash gourd for your hidden pearls. Before you go, I need to lift you from the steps on the stoop. A small hand mirror is like an aircraft if one flashes it at the sun and flaps her arms. I'm just giving you what you want. Um, and this is for uh, Max and Deb. I wrote this at, at, in, at, at their retreat. It's called Glinty Blue. To flub a jinx is to delay fate, a strategy that leaves things hanging until the next bulb flash pops from yonder, instills grace, and turns me back again to the city. Think of these pines with magnificent arterial bark, and the rocks along the shore caked with green moss. How lovely. The lake trumpets a blare of glinty blue from here anyway. And look, the goose feathers dot the tight surface of the water, while the water bugs skitter and feast on errant insects that bob and perform their last flutters. Yesterday, two dragonflies flew ecstatically connected over the water and landed on the dock right next to me. They looked awkward and embarrassed, their late summer urges compelling them to clumsy mating. I think of the city for a moment, its glare and trumpeting of all things cosmopolitan and decaying its concrete structures with tinted glass and stylish leather jackets, gas buses and fragrant cabs, milky rain and dodgy bits. 
What calm I encountered here may have prepared me for some other movement away. It swings me, this magnificent jinx of delay. Soothing poem. I would like to settle the score by brushing your hair until you go into a trance from being soothed by the gentle stroking of the brush in my hand that provides the relaxing sensation you so adore and crave. Then I would like to make you a sandwich. You're exhausted. You tell me you're exhausted, so you should sleep and not worry that I'll write on your face with a sharpie or devise some trick that will piss you off, like building a fake body out of pillows under the covers when you get up at night to pee, or startling you in the morning by hiding in the shower. I'm beyond that sort of stuff now that you're here with me, letting me brush your hair. My dream everything. I miss you like goddess dressing, like Swiss Smith's hot chocolate. I miss you like bird's eye pudding, like dream whip, like green apple now or laters, like fudge in a saucepan. I miss you like peppercorns on pizza, like de desert boots, like strawberry shortcake from Piccadilly. I miss you like bike ramps, toasted English muffins, like chlorine, like Poochie, Corky, Joey, Alice, Lewis, and Newt. I miss you like watching Badlands. I miss you like rubber knife fights. I miss you like green plastic army men. I miss you like a three-level tree fort. I miss you like hiking in the desert of Arizona. I miss you like running through a field in Vermont. I miss you like eating strawberries off the vine in summer. I miss you like the first glimpse of the ocean after a long winter. I miss you like sketching on the F train. I miss you like peanut butter bomb from Wild Ginger. I miss you like frosted Pop-Tarts, like yellow roses, like drawings for you in the morning. I miss you like Paris like walking through Prospect Park, like finding a turtle, like hogging popcorn in a movie, like the smell of roses on your neck, like dancing, like slippery glimpses of a lizard on a wall, like bats darting out of a beam of light, like swimming in a lake, like cold feet against my legs, like a morning kiss. I miss you like just chilling out to the max, like the smell of dial soap, like drowsy movies in bed, I miss you a lot my dream, everything. And I just, I know you, by the, when you hit the last three poems, you're supposed to say it, it's just tradition, but this is the last three poems. <laughs> Storm Kings. I'm working on a project that will eliminate the need for anxious circumstances. I plan on plying my trade by documenting my analysis with nice paper and a fancy pen. The pages will shine in a singular way, bringing an urgent joy to your afternoon with the radiant fizz of my metallic alphabet. After supper, the muscle shoals will become bloated and plump, making it difficult for the inane and mopey to navigate its soggy surface. People will embrace you while wear earth and silicone ooze from their cracks. I'll see to it that the stratagems for happiness are reinforced with the vigor of the Storm Kings. Yes, them. Syllables will roll off your tongue, giving people the impression that you are good at pronouncing words. You will no longer need a hushed, barely audible tone to confess your inadequacies, because you will no longer have any to confess. As for being fudged or inept in the face of authority, well, your grace and meatiness will be your license to hold things between your teeth as you fuck. You'll receive these details in the coming days via a Google Doc. I'll see to it that the delivery will accompany a template outlining a reasonable lack of worry, doubt, and most importantly, confusion. People will love you and position themselves in your life with the best view of your jaw in mind. There won't be a need for codes or inane principles because you'll always be too radiant and purposeful for that. And there are two soothing poems in this book, so this is the second soothing poem. A soothing moment, like in a garden. If a garden is soothing to you, then that. Yes, a garden with hyacinths or, oh, what is that fragrant flower? I only learned the names of several flowers. I associated them with relaxation or something. So this, a day in the sunlight in a garden with some flowers I can't name, great. 
I hope you understand that what I'm getting at here is to soothe you into thinking you are okay and that I know a lot less about flowers than I let on. The air in the garden is the same temperature as your skin, so you should feel comfortable in your skin just hanging out with the flowers I can't name for you like some people can because they had relatives who gardened. <laughs> they had people who took them out among the flowers and said, now this is named that. <laughs> and that is named this. And so on until it all sank in and you would know what someone meant when they referred to a particular flower or asked you to go pick a flower with a gorgeous sounding name and a bountiful garden. And you'd know what to look for. You wouldn't just stand there going, uh... You know the look of it, the texture of it, the name of it, and quite possibly even the Latin name for it, which is really just a way of showing off. <laughs> anyway, I hope you're relaxed by this poem. It's been a real mind fuck of a day. <laughs> and uh, Bobby Burt's gonna be up next. It was a pleasure meeting him, and I, um, uh, this is the last poem. And I'm, I'm, I just need to take this in for a second, because it really, I'm here, I'm, I'm reading my poems at Dia, thank you very much. Okay, for time and being. I miss you a lot, like totally trying to attach a wristwatch to thin air is silly, or trying to wave goodbye with a phantom limb is just so ridiculous. I tried to tell you love is glamorous, that it doesn't always have to end with the same dull thud of a half-eaten chicken thrown at the side of a dumpster. It doesn't suck to be us, because that just isn't possible. You see, I designed this day to be springy and tinny with delight. My fascination with necks and calf muscles and other amusements of the Brooklyn class is really delightful at its core. There's a scent of amber on my pillow. I want to do with you what rich people do every Sunday morning. Thank you. Bobby Bird grew up in Memphis during the golden age of the city's music scene. Black music, the great DJ Dewey Phillips, and WDIA radio, he says, probably saved my life. Bird and his wife Lee meandered through the Southwest until they moved to El Paso with their three kids in 1978. In 1985, they founded Cinco Puntos Press, which established his sorry, excuse me, which published his most recent collection, Otherwise My Life is Ordinary, in 2014. Bird has received a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship for Poetry, the D.H. Lawrence Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts International Fellowship to live in Mexico, and with, and with his wife, a Lannan Fellowship for Cultural Freedom. Bobby Bird's poetry has taken a rambling path, but don't let the literal bio, important as it is, fool you into thinking you know Bobby Bird. He's got a sly glint in his eye that should alert you. He sees things above and beyond. Not unlike a poet who was once his favorite, then fell into his disfavor, only to win it back again. Like Philip Whalen, who was a Zen monk, Bird is a Zen priest, and his seemingly casual observations have the chilling ability to cut to the bone. He has a couple of poems about killing flies, including house flies, about a fly that spent the night in the refrigerator, which ends, I grabbed it between my thumb and forefinger. It was cold to the touch, and I felt its thorax crack. Bird is no less unflinching in poems on the deaths of friends, and especially his mother. In those poems, his depth of connection and pain are deftly communicated, largely by refusing to kowtow to sentimentality. One age-old technique for living with tragedy is humor, and Bird is adept at this gambit, often spiraling it within a sensual and sometimes sexual embrace. 
Setting is important in Byrd's poems. In a rare Byrd poem set in New York City, he writes about taking the 66 crosstown bus. Like many New Yorkers, he feels the park and his emotions connect to someone met by chance who becomes his muse. And this is a quote from the poem. Tonight I'm glad for confusion and contradiction, especially now, I'm old enough to know. I'll see you tomorrow if I can find you. I've learned during all these years that the bus must turn around and go the other way. Tonight, we have the privilege of listening to and learning from one of poetry's true adepts. Please join me in welcoming Bobby Bird to Dia. Uh, what a joy. Uh, like Todd, I'm sort of blown away to be here, actually. It's quite an honor. I heard. Uh, Joanne Kager read last year, and it was just wonderful to see people and see everybody so involved in poetry. Um, and I think when I, when I heard, Vincent gives like the world's greatest introductions, you know? <laughs> Although I would have liked to have been rambunctious. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite an honor, you know, to be rambunctious. So I thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to, what I decided to do, read from a number of different books and to sort of introduce myself. And I'm going to turn on my clock so I don't um, go too long. Pomegranates. Muhammad, may God grant him peace, said to eat the pomegranates. Eat them. Eat the luscious seeds from the pretty purple pod, lovely, love like a flower, love like hummingbirds and bees, lovely, and will we lose our envy, lose our hate, a man for a woman, a woman for a man, surely not, of course not, but let's eat them anyway. Let's eat the luscious seeds from the pretty purple pod. Let's eat them. Let's eat them. Let's eat them. There's a wonderful little book, uh, Back Roads to Far Town, Far Towns. It's the Basho's journals as he goes through Japan. He thinks he's going to die before he gets back. But it, sits, it used to sit by my reading chair, and I used to read it. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. It's by From White Pines Press. Back Roads to Far Towns. I wish old Basho would come to my house, especially when it's winter, a paltry desert winter, warm enough this evening to sit outside in the city night, huddled up in a warm jacket and a good hat, the trees bare-boned, old men, Basho and me. We will drink some red wine, a bottle of, seven, of, the, of the 749 Merlot from the 711, the one with the yellow kangaroo. And we'll swap stories like that one about the frog jumping into the pond. Splash! What's the story behind that, huh? Or maybe he'll want to know what it's like to be pissing in the backyard with my two sons. The full moon like a Chinese coin, ha! We'll sit there on our sorry asses, open-mouthed at the beauty of a dying cockroach. We'll write a few poems, three-liner thingamabobs, old man fingers, Useless five by three by five index cards. I'll lose somewhere. Why not? The gate swings open and shut, open and shut, open and shut. The cockroach is the gatekeeper. Basho and me, we will empty that bottle of wine. 
Enough, he says, is always enough. That's a good one, I say, and we giggle. And the big bright moon dodges back and forth behind the clouds. There's a photograph, you can't see it, uh, from 1977. It's me and my wife sitting at this wonderful restaurant. It's in this book, sitting at this wonderful restaurant. Um, and uh, uh, when we were right before we moved to El Paso, it's called Gavachos in the photograph. Gavachos is a, a Spanish word now, but it comes from French. It means foreigner. And gavacho is a little bit better than the word gringo. If somebody calls you uh, gavacho, they might let you use the bathroom. But if they call you gringo, you know you can't get in. They'll t they tell you when you they they tell you when you're growing up that water goes under the bridge, but they don't tell you about the bridge where Mar oh, that goes over to Avenida Juarez, two doors down. Wait a minute. That goes over to Avenue Nida Juarez, where Martino's restaurant is, two doors down from the Kentucky Club. The imagination opens those doors, and there I am, the big bearded Gavacho in the straw hat, the coral necklace, drinking Dos Equis Oscura, and thinking I will have enough riches in my pocket to nourish my heart in case of love. It's Lee's 32nd birthday, 1977, a year before we moved to El Paso. I am 35. Isn't she beautiful? We sit in the corner by the windows where the tiny Tarahumara children stand forever with their, hand, their outstretched hands reaching into the emptiness of the 21st century and a kaleidoscope of people walk by, back and forth, looking for ways to lose themselves in the dwindling twilight, glittering mirrors, hard-crusted bolillo rolls, French onion soup, Chateaubriand for two fried in butter French style. We become drunk and happy and stuffed. We wander the streets holding hands, we climb a rickety staircase to a small $10 room with clean sheets. We make love like resplendent wild beasts in search of something Jesus said. And then we walk back into the jingle jangle of Avenida Juarez. That was 40 years ago now. So much has changed. Pedro Ruelas Alvarez, who took this, the street photographer who took this photo, is dead now. Like my mother is dead. My sister Patsy is dead. My brother Bill is dead. Like Lee's mother and father, so many friends are dead. Water under the bridge for that. Another Gavacho couple is sitting in that booth tonight, and they are looking out the window at the Indian children with the large black eyes, and they are afraid of what they see in that confusion. Give them a dollar, mister. Give them a five. Give them back the secret places in the mountains where the spirit thrives. That's what I always want to do, to give away something to make myself whole, but it seems so impossible even to give something to myself. At least I feel like I am at home now, here in El Paso, walking back and forth across the bridge, and I'm hoping to find enough riches in my pocket to, to cure some of the ache in my heart. This is my prayer. May God grant us all love and a little bit of peace on Avenida Juarez. Amen. So this is another one of my New York City poems. 
Remember in May of 2011, the world was going to end, and every time you came out of the subway, somebody gave you a pamphlet saying that Timothy and Paul were saying the world was going to end. What was supposed to happen didn't happen. New York City, May 2011. The world was supposed to end yesterday. That's what the Bible said, according to the preacher passing out red and yellow doom flowers. Doom flyers. When I climbed out of the subway at Broadway in 110th, turned out Paul and Timothy got it wrong. They talked to God to see where their math went askew. God said to the end of the world, needs more juice. Juice, he said. The end of the world needs more juice. Like that jazz sextet at the African market on 116th, the other side of Malcolm X. And three black guys tooting their bra brass horns, New World Peace, Zulu. And the piano cubano talks back voodoo bebop mojo. While middle-aged Jewish guy and a wife beater translates the word on his drums. And I give thanks to the God of juice for the skinny Asian woman straight from Juilliard thumping a big stand-up bass. Peace, peace. That bass is moaning, peace, 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 brothers and sisters, all five of them riffing together, going every witch away. Maybe this is the end of the world. That's what the Muslims are thinking. They, left their t they have left their tents and are down on their hands and knees praising Allah and all that there is, happily kissing the ground with their, kissing the ground and their beautiful prayer rugs, and that ancient Japanese guy with the goofiest smile is slurping at his noodles and toe-tapping like he understands the secrets of the universe. Rumor is, is that the old man is enlightened. Although you would never guess it, he's eyeing the young women of the new American poetry. Lesbians are straight. He has no preferences. They are wearing skirts. They're wearing naked legs. Their hips sway to keep time with the music. Oh, they prophesy the yin and the yang. Oh, they prophesy the holy circle that gathers us all. Peace, peace, they sing. Peace, we want peace. We thank you, brothers and sisters. We thank you. And the quintet plays its last note, each of them aglow with happiness. They know they have opened the gate into the meadow. Tomorrow will be Monday, and perhaps the mockingbirds will bring, will bring us the same good news the gates opening once again into the same meadow. And yes, maybe the world has already ended. Maybe, just maybe, we're the last to know. Elegy on the death of my big brother. The preacher said, let us pray. The preacher sermonized on my brother's drunkenness. The preacher said that my brother Bill had let alcoholism become the meaning of his life. This is why my brother hated religion. The preacher didn't know, wouldn't understand that my brother had learned to love God even when he was sitting in the woods sucking at his vodka and orange juice. That's why he had told the preachers, the preachers with all their words and their prayers to leave him alone. He would talk with God instead. God lived alone in the woods of Mississippi, especially in the wintertime when the earth was damp and cold. Many hours my brother sat in those woods his rifle or shotgun cupped in his hands like a lover. 
He waited for the deer, the rabbits, the squirrels, and the birds. He had learned since childhood to feed on their flesh, but as he grew into an old man, he understood that he loved the wild animals. He was killing what he loved. That was the koan of his life. Animal blood seeped warm from his hands into the earth. For years, my brother, who sat alone in the silence of the woods, had begun talking to himself. At first, he thought he was whispering to his gun. But no, he was whispering to a lost place inside himself, a wild place that needed no words. And while he waited, he found wild mushrooms and learned their names. He bought books and studied photographs. He ate the mushrooms, careful not to poison himself or his sons or his grandchildren who loved to eat at his table. He cooked the mushrooms with venison and rabbit and fish and squirrel, onions and lots of garlic and tomatoes and all sorts of spices gravy and biscuits and black-eyed peas. Oh, he was a good cook. An old-fashioned white man, backwoods southern cook. My children, when they were little, loved Uncle Bill's hush puppies fried deep in lard. And they loved my brother. They didn't know about his sorrow and his alcoholism. To them, he was a mysterious man who loved to be alive with food and laughter. Uncle Bill, Uncle Bill, tell us a story. Sure enough, God heard my brother whispering. God listened deeply. God wants us all to sit in the dark woods all alone. So God began talking to my brother. They met in a secret place where there was a dead stump for my brother to sit on. The ground was thick with dead, rotting leaves, rotting into the earth, mushrooms poking up like sperm out of the mud and dark leaves. Sacred ground, God taught my brother many things, especially about the woods, how each moment to the next is totally new and fresh, totally independent, totally perfect. Each moment exists only in his own mind, no one else's, and without reason. Yes, that's true, my brother said, and he shut his eyes and prayed. But my brother couldn't stop drinking the vodka and the orange juice. He brought along a little silver flask every time he met with God. He blamed his drunkenness on God. Surely God could do something, but God would do nothing. It was not his business. And after a long while, God ran out of patience with my brother. That was okay. My brother was angry with God, too. He didn't trust God anymore. God had taken away his sex. He couldn't make love anymore, couldn't get it up. God and my brother said goodbye. Years passed like that. My brother had become lonely again in the woods without God. The dead stump in the dark woods was no longer a holy place. God and my brother was was no longer a holy place. It was quiet and peaceful, but something had seeped away. What was death anyway? The wild animals had taught him about death. My brother had seen so many animals die. They had been his guide into where the darkness begins, but they left something out. The gate didn't swing open. Time, then suddenly, God showed up again. My brother and God spent hours together. They murmured strange guttural sounds at each other. They were like the animals on their hands and knees, sniffing at the air and the earth. Be patient, God said. Walk in beauty, God said. Walk in peace, God said. Walk in beauty, God said. The next morning, my brother 
was anchored in his flat bottom boat in a backwater on the Mississippi River. It was his favorite spot tucked into some bit bushes 20 feet from the bank, just down from a bend. The water still, but a stone's throw from where he sat, the big river churned and roiled. He had been there since an hour before dawn. He, he had his hot shotgun cupped in his hands. He was sipping at his vodka and orange juice. He heard them coming. A line of mallards flew over his sh sh left shoulder. He aimed. He led the ducks like our pawpaw had taught him when he was a little boy. He squeezed the trigger. Blam! He pumped his empty shell hissing into the water. Blam! Blam! Again, blam! My brother shot, shot three out of the sky. He gathered them up and waited again. And again the ducks came. Blam! Blam! That was the limit. That was the law. My brother began to cry as these last two ducks fell and splashed into the still water. Maybe my brother knew that his time had come too, had come to its end. Maybe God had told him. Maybe he knew all by himself. Or maybe he understood that God and that wild place inside were one and the same that place that needed no words, the place of silence. Maybe he knew nothing of, of what awaited him. He was done. He dragged his boat onto its trailer. He tossed the wet ducks, their beautiful long necks, hanging like cut pieces of rope into the back of his truck. He climbed into the cab and turned on the ignition. My brother's heart exploded inside the shell of his body. That was supposed to be the end, and that was the end. This is how my brother learned to love God. And I can now say goodbye to my brother Bill. So I'm gonna do like Todd and say this is two more poems. And um, I think, and one is there are two uh, love poems, and I got to figure out where page. Oh shit! Maybe just one more poem. Uh, let me. I have a book. My ordinary. My wife. Uh, in uh, 1981, my two sons were, 83, my two sons uh, uh, were burned real bad in a fire. And it was real difficult for our family, as you can imagine. Um, but they're wonderful young men now. They're great, great grown-up young men. But my wife, as we were going through that turmoil, she became a Christian. And I became a, uh, practicing, started sitting, staring at a wall. And so that's been sort of this thing that we've, uh, uh, this uh, uh, space between us. Uh, so I wanted to read this poem. T talking to my wife, who was away at church. Remember that pear tree in Santa Rosa? That was a long time ago, huh? 30 years and something. It was an August like this is an August. Susie was three or four. The fields were so hot and dusty. The Pecos River was a sad little stream that summer. But in the shade of that big pear tree, the flies and the bugs like you and me were busy feeding on the juicy pears. Gurdjieff had sent us and our friends to that place, him and that weird Russian guy, Uspensky. I won't tell that story. It's way too long. Just let me say, we were out there in the dust and the heat in search of the miraculous. It was right there in front of us all the time. Those pears, the bugs, and the heat, our friends, our daughter Susie, her brothers to come, you and me, I wish you were here this morning. Already it's so hot. I promise not to argue about God anymore. 
I just want to remind you about those flies and those bugs, the Pecos River and where it came from and where it was going. I want to talk about those delicious pears. Memo to my granddaughter, Hannah. My granddaughter is right over here. She's 20. And this was written, she's at school here. We're real proud of her. Um, memo to my granddaughter, Hannah. This is when she was two. Memo to my granddaughter, Hannah. Rufus the cat is chasing his tail, which means the Holy Ghost is chasing the Holy Ghost. Like you were two years old, your mother is my daughter, and my own mother is dead now. She was the Holy Ghost dying. The rattle in her throat, her parched lips, all those last few days, a message to the beginning and to the end, to the full and to the empty, to the up and to the down, to the dark and to the light. I held her to the dark and to the light, saying goodbye, saying goodbye. I held her hand while she died. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of fun.